What can we learn as we reflect on climbing the eighth and ninth rungs of the ladder of divine ascent on freedom from anger, meekness, and remembrance of wrongs? Why is anger such a spiritually hazardous emotion? Wasn't Jesus angry when he overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple? Is meekness always weakness? What does it mean to be meek? Does Jesus expect Christians to be like walking carpets? And why is the remembrance of wrongs so spiritually hazardous? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. St. John Climacus wrote The Ladder of Divine Ascent as a handbook for monks living the monastic life, cut off from the world and the isolation of the Egyptian desert monasteries, in a world before global communications where the monk could easily call his family on the monastery phone. In the first chapter, he has some advice for the layman who wishes to live the perfect life as best as he can in the world. But the advice for his fellow monks must be allegorized to apply to our lives as laymen. Each step of the ladder of divine ascent builds on the prior steps, building with our detachment and exile from the values of the sinful world, followed by the need for obedience to the law and the gospel, how we should be persistent in our repentance. And we compared this struggle to the struggle of the Allies in fighting the axis of evil fascism in World War II. And the prior step of the ladder was on remembrance of death and joy-making mourning. And the eighth and the ninth steps on the ladder of divine ascent pairs two virtue. Step eight on freedom from anger and on meekness. And step nine on remembrance of wrongs. St. Paul in Ephesians exhorts that though we can be angry at times, we should not sin. St. Paul exhorts us to realize that being truthful to our neighbor and our very essence as Christians should lead us to control our anger and avoid anger wherever possible. St. Paul exhorts, Put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new nature, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. And St. John Climacus teaches us, Freedom from anger is victory over nature, and insensibility to insults acquired by struggles and sweat. What does it mean to be meek? We hear the Beatitudes saying, the meek shall inherit the earth, and we puzzle over the meaning of the word. St. John Climacus teaches us, meekness is an immovable state of the soul which remains unaffected, whether in evil report or in good report, in dishonor or praise. And we also review the commentaries by two Orthodox priests whose wisdom is increased by the many confessions they've heard of spiritual counselors for many years and they have much useful advice for those of us struggling with anger and the need to be meek. Father Vasilios describes meekness. We tend to think of meekness as a personality trait. When we hear the word meek, we usually think of someone softly spoken, easily pushed around, who never raises his voice, maybe even someone who is weak. But meekness is not the same as weakness, nor is it a particular kind of personality. Meekness is a virtue. And he continues, our Lord described himself as meek, yet he smashed up the markets outside the temples in Jerusalem. He denounced the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees as hypocrites and a brood of vipers, telling them they were going to go to hell. And Jesus frequently rebuked his apostles and admonished the Israelites for their faithlessness. As Christians, we were called upon to take up Christ's yoke and imitate his meekness. That does not mean we should be doormats, or in the words of Princess Leia, walking carpets. Father Mac teaches us, those who are progressing on the road to meekness must make as their first rule. I will never speak in an angry tone of voice to anyone who speaks in anger to me. I will not answer back in kind. Plus, I will never allow myself to speak in anger to anyone. And this is especially true when I give advice or counsel or rebuke those who are under my authority as a parent or a teacher or as a boss. As my second rule, I will not allow my mind to think angry thoughts against those who speak in angry words to me. Also, I will not allow my mind to think angry thoughts against anyone. And we should be free from anger. Father Mac asks, Why do we become angry? Is it not because we are pursuing the perfect in this world? Is it not because we are busy building up our own kingdoms instead of the kingdom of God? Is it not because we are concerned about how we appear and are treated in this world, rather than how we will appear and be treated in the world to come? Does not our anger most often have its source in our own exalted opinion of ourselves? And anger is when you build your house on sand. 
when the waves of life come and pound against the house, it does not stand, and great is its fall. But meekness is like the house built on the rocks, that stands firm against the pounding of waves. Wrath is a reminder of hidden hatred, that is to say, remembrance of wrongs. Wrath is a desire for the injury of the one who provoked you. Irascibility is the untimely blazing up of the heart. Bitterness is a movement of displeasure seated in the soul. Have pity on those who refuse to control their anger, who are always bitter, angry, and resentful. All of us have a bad day, but when a hothead has a bad day, he has a really, really bad day. And St. John Climacus teaches us, an angry person is a willing epileptic, who due to an involuntary tendency keeps convulsing and falls down. And when those who do not control their anger have a bad day, they may strike out at their wives or their children, or may harm or even kill those they encounter. And if St. John Climacus were alive today, surely he would mention road rage, and how hazard it is to curse at the other drivers, although they don't hear us. St. John Climacus teaches us that malice thrives in the deceptively meek and silent. And Father Vasilio celebrates that we so often judge meekness and patience by the externals. And he notes, I've seen people remain calm in the face of abusiveness, and after I expressed my admiration for their patience, they confessed the boiling rage that was within them, which in many cases lasts for days, weeks, months, or even years. Father Vasilios notes that St. John Climacus may be warning us against bottling up our anger. It is far better to lose one's temper and let it out, rather than appear forbearing, patient, and humble, while fuming with rage inside. Of course, it is better neither to lose our temper, nor to allow our anger to fester. And he continues, Sometimes, either inwardly or outwardly, we lash out at our critics because we fail to see the truth that is being pointed out to us. Only when we are humble are we able to see things as they really are. Moreover, we tend to think we're superior to our critics, so that even when we do admit that the criticism is correct, our reaction is, Who are you to criticize me? In the same vein, the cynic philosopher Antisthenes advises us to pay attention to your enemies, for they are the first to notice your faults, for you can learn from their criticisms. And Father Vasilius speculates, Imagine how life-changing it would be to rejoice in what others think of causes for sorrow and anger, to find joy in what otherwise is a cause of so much sin and misery. The holiest of people, even the saints, are not those who are loved and honored by everyone. Even those blessed people have enemies. Even these are hated. To be holy is to transform our response to hatred into love and joy. If all were saints, we would be living in a perfect world, and it would be a world in which sorrow is joy, in which absolutely everything, however bad, is a cause of thanksgiving and gladness. When someone is irrationally and obsessively angry at a neighbor, and they tell everyone they know their faults and try to destroy them, they may be telling you more about themselves than they realize. Sometimes their anger is for a moral weakness they refuse to see in themselves. In other words, gaslighting. Another interesting passage is when Jesus shows us how to be free of anger. Jesus is foretelling how he would be delivered and condemned to death by the scribes and Pharisees. And what is the response of James and John, sons of Zebedee? They ask Jesus whether they will be seated to decide when he reigns in glory. But Jesus does not get angry. Rather, he simply answers a question, that it is not he but the Father who chooses who will be seated where. But the other disciples become angry with him, though again Jesus has them lay aside their anger, explaining that as he came to serve and not to be served, so the greatest among them will be the servants. And another recurring theme in the Ladder of Divine Ascent is that the climb is not a one-time conversion vaulting us to the top of the ladder, but is rather a process, a changing of habits, that we practice for the rest of our lives, ever climbing until we reach the great IMAX theater in the sky with screens 40 foot wide and 40 foot tall that replay all the major events in our lives at the end of days. And St. John Climacus teaches us, the beginning of blessed patience is to accept dishonor with sorrow and bitterness of soul. The middle stage is to be free from pain in the midst of these things. But perfection, if it is possible, is to regard dishonor as praise. Let the first rejoice, let the second be strong, and blessed is the third, for he exults in the Lord. All sins are bound together, one sin leads to another. St. John Climacus imagines what anger would say if it were to name its relatives. My mother's are vainglory, love of money, greed, and sometimes lust. My father is called conceit. My daughters are remembrance of wrongs, enmity, self-justification, and hatred. In this step, St. John Climacus also urges, let the tyrant anger be bound with the chains of meekness and be beaten by patience and dragged out by holy love. 
and the antithesis of anger is love, as St. Paul writes in Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And you must apply these teachings on meekness with common sense. After all, St. John Climacus was writing for monks who did not have to worry about earning a living in a cold, cruel world. Christians living in the world have an obligation to earn a living for their family, and sometimes radical meekness will appear to be weakness. Sometimes we just have to defend ourselves and our reputation so we can be productive members of society. And there's another scenario where meekness shows weakness. Based on my experience as a facilitator in divorce support programs, Christian wives often confuse weakness with meekness when their husband physically abuses them or their children. In that instance, you're compelled to assume that if your husband is capable of physically abusing you, he is capable of physically abusing your children. And if you're in a physically abusive marriage, Jesus wants you and your children to be strong and to separate so you can live where you feel safe. Difficult decisions must be made in difficult home situations, and when applying the advice in this book in a family situation, when striving to live a godly life, ask these simple questions. First and most important, what's the best for our children? Second, what is best for my spouse? And compelling our spouse to earn a living and be responsible for their actions is often beneficial for their soul and self-confidence. Lastly, what is best for my spirit? There is a story in the Gospel where Jesus is angry, which reminds me of one Sunday when I was young and visiting a Baptist men's ministry meeting. This good old boy was launching into quite an impressive preaching on leading a godly life, and he started talking about anger, how you should never be angry, how anger always leads to sin, how anger always leads to bitterness. And when he paused for breath, I, being young and foolish, chirped up, but Jesus certainly seemed to be quite angry when he drove out the money changers from the temple. And this remark quite rattled him, and he lost his train of thought, and quite ruined the rehearsed cadence of his little mini-sermon. Now, being good Baptists, they collected names and addresses and phone numbers of everyone attending, to be used on Tuesdays when good Baptists go visiting. Now, I wasn't visited, but that good old boy did give me a call later that week. Well, I was really wondering about whether or not I should give you a call about last Sunday, but finally, after praying about it, I decided I would. You see, I've been working with some of these boys in my group real close, encouraging them to let Jesus in their hearts and give up on their drinking and carousing, and your comments just wasn't much help. I was really thinking about asking you not to come back, but after praying about it, I got to figuring out that that just wouldn't be right. So you're welcome to come back as long as you sit in the back row and be quiet. And you might say that I climbed up the ladder a rung or two that day. It is not enough to be right. We should be right and humble. And we should sometimes practice silence, lest pride gets in our way, lest we be right in the wrong way. Which leads us to the next step. Step 9, Unremembrance of Wrongs. Although Christians who live in the world are not able to always live as radically meek a life as do monks at the isolated monasteries of the Egyptian desert, we are able to follow all the advice offered to us on the danger of remembering wrongs. And our two Orthodox priest commentators also have much useful advice. Even if we have not forgiven with our heart, we should at least humble ourselves and be the first to say sorry. Realizing our own hypocrisy, we may be moved to strive all the more to make our forgiveness sincere. And he continues, When we contemplate God, the only good one, the only holy one, the almighty one who created all things, suffering on the cross and loving humility and saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How can we continue to bear a grudge? But all too often we seek to justify our anger. I've heard people say, but this person knows what he does. Do you think that would have made any difference? If the Pharisees, many of whom did know better, had repented and asked Christ to forgive them from the foot of the cross, would our Lord have refused? And he goes on, while we must always be compassionate to human weakness and not condemn Christians for being nothing more than human, we should, at the very least, learn to ask God to help us and have pity on us for being unforgiving. That would be a start. Alas, too many of us refuse even to admit that we should forgive, and we fail to see how hypocritical we are for not doing so. Thus, we turn Christ's commandment to forgive into a naive platitude rather than a real and stern commandment by which we shall all be judged. Thus, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, I believe I should forgive. Help me to really forgive. Which is a paraphrasing of Mark 9.24. And humility quenches anger, as St. John Climacus teaches us. As with the appearance of light, darkness retreats, so at the fragrance of humility, all anger and bitterness vanishes. And yet, in another passage, meekness and anger are contrasted. 
It is a mark of extreme meekness, even in the presence of one's offender, to be peacefully and lovingly disposed towards him in one's heart. And then it is certainly a mark of hot temper when a person continues to quarrel and rage against his offender, both by words and gestures, even when by himself. The last passage causes me pain. It reminds me of the many broken relationships I've heard described in divorce support groups, where the faults of the ex-spouse are sought out, where animosity is kept alive, and where both spouses bait the other. Sometimes, as a divorce support facilitator, I see a gentle soul who's lovingly disposed towards an ex-spouse who has left, but that's rare. So, dear Lord, may we be peacefully and lovingly disposed towards our spouse when they offend us, May we have a fond place for them in our heart, and may we have pity and compassion for those closest to us. May our temper not be too hot. May we not quarrel or rage against our spouse, neither when we are together nor when we are apart. We pray that we may not say harsh words about our spouse to others, especially not to our children. And the icons of the ladder of divine ascent often show demons dragging climbers off the ladder into the abyss of the darkened souls. And it is clear that the demons pull up more sinners off the rung of remembrance of wrongs than any other. St. John Climacus teaches us, Remembrance of wrongs is the consummation of anger, the keeper of sins, hatred of righteousness, ruin of virtues, poison of the soul, worm of the mind, shame of prayer, cessation of supplication, estrangement of love, a nail stuck in the soul, pleasureless feelings cherished in the sweetness of bitterness, continuous sin, unsleeping transgression, and hourly malice. And Father Vasilios teaches us, devout Christians will often use the scriptures, the church fathers, and even examples from the lives of the saints to make their unhealed passion appear to be righteousness. But we should be wary of pulling verses out of scripture without reading the surrounding verses with context. And interestingly, St. John Climacus also cautions us of cherry picking or proof texting, not reading scriptures to discern the truth, but rather to justify our prejudices which can easily lead to quoting scriptures to justify our own sinful attitudes. And St. John Climacus teaches us, Remembrance of wrongs is an interpreter of scripture which explains the words of the Spirit allegorically in order to suit its own disposition. And Jimmy Carter remembers in his devotions how in his youth his Deep South Bible study group annually invited seminary professors to show how the scriptures justified the separate but equal doctrine that made separation of blacks from whites the law of the land. So the remembrance of wrongs is a nail stuck in your soul, poisoning your soul, festering malice hourly, ruining all virtues. Indeed, remembrance of wrongs is a keeper of sins, as these passages following the Lord's Prayer in Matthew makes clear. If you forgive men their trespasses, so will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. And Jesus teaches us that we're to be perfect just as our Father in Heaven is perfect. But not too many Christians worry about this passage, thinking that they do not need to be perfect since all will be forgiven. But Jesus must mean we must be perfect in some manner, and perhaps we need to be perfect in forgiving others. That we cannot cherry pick whom we will forgive and whom we will not. Whether we can forgive those who we do not know too well, but not those close to us who have hurt us deeply. And perhaps these teachings means that we need to be perfect in forgiving others, or everyone, whether they have hurt us or not. No exceptions. Remembrance of wrongs is also the cessation of love, and remembrance of wrongs goes further than mere forgiveness, as we can see in this disturbing passage following the Beatitudes. So, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. And love erases anger, and without anger forgiveness is possible. As St. John Climacus teaches us in these steps, He who has put a stop to anger has also destroyed remembrance of wrongs. He who has obtained love has banished revenge, and a banquet of love dispels hatred. And remembrance of wrongs is the worm of the mind. Worms grow in a rotten tree, and malice finds a place in falsely meek and silent people. He who casts it out has found forgiveness, but he who clings to it is deprived of mercies. And there are many who think they're Christians who insist on following Jesus on their own terms. They don't mind forgiving most people, but they want to choose those whom they won't forgive, those whose shortcomings they do not wish to forget. And we should all pray that we will forgive all sins and forget all wrongs so we can boldly ask our Savior Jesus to release us from our sins. And St. John Climacus concludes, The forgetting of wrongs is a sign of true repentance. 
But he who dwells on them and thinks that he is repenting is like a man who thinks he's running while he's really asleep. And let no one regard dark spite as a harmless fashion, for it often manages to reach out even to spiritual men. And we will conclude with an observation from Father Mac. When I begin to notice how many people treat me poorly and speak to me rudely, my lists of offenses grow longer and grows larger. I become more angry and more bitter. I love less and am less able to receive love. I become so embittered that I experience no love and I give no love. I'm alone in hell. The demons have me just where they want me to be. And in the future rungs of the ladder, ahead is the 10th, 11th, and 12th rung of the ladder of divine ascent, on the dangers of slander, talkativeness, and lying. And yes, slander is distinguished from lying, although they are cousins. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Both of these editions of the Ladder of Divine Ascent use the same translation, but each has its own thoughtful introductions. And the introduction in the classics of Western spirituality is by Bishop Callistos Ware. And we find this work as easy to read as the works of the Stoic philosophers that influence Christianity in the monastic tradition. And we also have the commentaries of Father John Mack and Father Vasilios, with a hard last name which are valuable because they reflect their experience as priests hearing confessions. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.